Hello. I'm also known as Munanitz, our young eagle, by my tribe. I am a member of the Northern Cheyenne, Lakota, Blackfeet nations, and drink Earl Grey to honor my English heritage. <laughs> I grew up in my mother's home village on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in eastern Montana. Here, I was raised along the Tongue River, surrounded by my extended family. This is where I was taught to hunt by my father and learned to make dried meat by my mother, who learned this from her mother. My grandmother can be seen here in front of her log cabin. She only spoke Cheyenne and did not speak English. Every tribe, oh wait, whoa. So, there are only five certified fluent speakers and writers of the Cheyenne language out of 10,000 members, which is technically 0%. We are at a turning point in history where the living link to our language and culture is about to break. To combat this culture loss, my tribe and others have turned to technology to revitalize our languages. This effort includes grants such as the Montana Indian Language Preservation Pilot Program, which distributed $2 million to the tribes of Montana. However, such efforts are perilous. Every tribe has experienced commercial exploitation and cultural appropriation. This exploitation dissuades elders and knowledge keepers from sharing their knowledge. For instance, you notice these authors are all pigment deprived. Here you see Paul Goebel and George Grinnell who made a good living off us. Public domain law, a constitutional and Jeffersonian ideal, enables this exploitation. While intellectual property law protects the poetry of an individual, my tribe's songs are considered free to be commoditized by any outsider. To counter the menace of public domain and exploitation, we need communal IP law. Communal IP merely extends the respect for individual rights to tribes and is advocated by the, United, the UN. For tribes, communal IP is the recognition of indigenous access models. Our indigenous access models exist because, like the Bernie Springs here, knowledge is sacred. For the Lakota, simply breathing is sacred. Therefore, what we give, therefore, what we give voice to has power. We only seek to respect this power. American IP law is counter to indigenous access models. Every tribe has unique protections integral to their heritage. Though we willingly share much of our culture, such as the powwow, we also have stories which cannot be, cannot be told unless there's snow on the ground. So what's our recourse? Out of fear, the most common response is to simply not share our knowledge, even with each other. To solve this, we can build a digital knowledge keeper, keeper to safeguard our heritage. Much how, like, much how like my wife controls me with her Teutonic chains, <laughs> she's the one that caught me, a digital knowledge keeper must limit its users. Let's consider, for example, a 12-year-old Cheyenne girl. She should have easy access to Cheyenne stories and songs meant for adolescent females and no more. The goal isn't to seal our knowledge behind a padlock. The goal is to protect our heritage for future generations. Intellectual exploitation raises the question though, should we be even be digitizing our heritage? Data, as you know, is inherently insecure. Just ask the NSA. We have stories that cannot be written, never mind digitized. Digital preservation overall must exist within a policy framework, which is also a legal framework. Our primary recourse, uh, uh, our primary guardian of our knowledge is the domain of our sovereign tribal government, such as mine, the Northern Cheyenne. A digital knowledge keeper will be subject, it should be subject to a digital strategy implemented by each tribal government. It is important for every tribe to retain control of the digitization, collection, and management of their heritage. A tribe's sovereignty is best protected, 
if they deploy and maintain their own digital knowledge keeper as they please. But what would this system look like? It's about the source code, as you see here. It must be free, secure, standards-based, and accessible. And broadly and somewhat ironically, what I'm describing is open source software. And here's Tux, the Linux Penguin and open source movement mascot. An open source, an open source digital knowledge keeper can empower tribes to own their culture and underlying software that protects it. This lets them focus upon preservation and not software. The real difficulty is the collection and preservation. Beyond mere preservation, a digital knowledge keeper keeps the knowledge alive. It will amplify Cheyenne language revitalization, for instance. Instead of learning their language in a vacuum like now, it will allow Cheyenne children to learn their language in the context of their heritage. Is it just a dream, though? No. I'm the executive director of a new nonprofit whose goal it is to build open source tools to preserve and protect tribal heritages. With the support of the tribal community, present and future supporters like you, we'll be deploying free language learning software this fall and next year. But that's just a stopgap. We need you, as voters, to advocate uh, enforceable communal IP law in America. The Cheyenne tribe and others must be given legal control of its cultural knowledge. Are you with me? Thank you.